physician and yoga teacher and I live and practice in Mystic, Connecticut, right around the corner. And today I'm going to be talking about the topic of deep rest and soft landing. I think we all we all need rest and that is what I'm here to talk about and why this has become such a cornerstone of the way I live and the way I work with my patients and my students. So I'm going to begin with a very tangible topic from Native Landscaping, and we're going to take that into a metaphor and work from that into thinking about our own lives. So soft landings, I don't know how many of you have heard that term before. Um, most people I mention it to just love the way it sounds. Soft landing. Like it's... So a soft landing is Think about a tree. Imagine a tree in your yard or in your neighborhood or maybe right outside and think about the shape of the tree, the roots, the trunk, the branches. And think about the breadth of the branches. And now think about the ground underneath the branches. So most of us are beginning, or maybe have done a lot of work on cultivating pollinators, attracting pollinators to our yards and to the landscapes around us. We are trying to bring in the plants that our native butterflies and bees and moths love. This is another piece of that puzzle. All of those pollinators that live in what we call keystone trees, like oaks and maples, birches, those pollinators begin their life cycle up in the leaves, and then there's a point where they fall out of the tree. And they fall out as a, in the pupil stage. So they're not a butterfly, they don't have wings yet. They fall down to hit the ground beneath the tree, and that's where they start the next stage. So a soft landing recognizes that when those creatures hit the earth, they need to keep growing and surviving. And what they need to do that is leaf litter and wildflowers and what we call understory plants. What they don't need is this. And this is a model groomed lawn, perfectly groomed, grass growing right up to the tree and probably mowed right up to the tree. It is a barren landscape. And when those pupae, when those pollinators fall out of that tree, they fall on barren ground and they die. This is a landscape that has no space for rust. And in fact, if we step back from thinking about the pollinators and think about the humans who have the job of maintaining this landscape, this is no, there's no space for rust here. Somebody is mowing this lawn every other day, probably. Someone is maintaining it, right? They're probably edging right up to it. There's a lot of work. Take a moment and think about your own life. And think about perfection. How does it feel? Just hold that image. If I told you, you'd better be perfect when you step into this room today. How does that feel? your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how I feel every time I have to put together one of these talks and then I have to let that go. Because there's no such thing and also it is damaging internally and externally to hold ourselves to that standard. So now take a moment and think about this word. Think about a soft landing. How does that feel in your life? If I said in our own lives, internally, we can learn to cultivate this 
idea of a soft landing, not a perfectly groomed internal landscape, or external for that matter, but a way to rest. How does that feel? So think about your own life and think about this concept of rest. And when I define rest to my patients, I always define it as time to do nothing productive. So that's liminal time, time between time, time without a schedule, certainly time without a device, no, no phone telling you and calling you to the next thing, no obligations. How does that feel? I was just talking to someone in the hallway explaining this concept and she said time to watch the wildlife in your backyard which is what we were talking about before the, the talk started I always think especially this time of year I spend a lot of time a lot of time but sometimes it's just a few minutes at a time sitting in my yard watching the bees doing nothing they're working they're doing what they do but I'm simply resting The concept of deep rest takes this a little, a little deeper. So if we say rest is simply time to do nothing, and let me reiterate that you can find rest in your life. Even one minute makes a difference. So you don't have to struggle to find huge chunks of time or whole weekends to go on retreat. Those things are wonderful, but you can begin with just a couple of minutes where you have nothing to do and letting yourself do nothing. Deep rest is a state of profound relaxation on all levels. And we can access that when we get high quality sleep, we touch into this state. There are certain meditation techniques that bring us to this state. And then yoga nidra, which is a rest practice that I'll be talking about today, is developed specifically to bring us to this state. Um, and I want to point out that deep rest is not a productivity hack because I'm starting to see this. I'm starting to see deep rest advertised as a way that, oh, take these 20 minutes and rest, and then you can do more stuff. That is, <laughs> that is the opposite of where we're going here. It is true that accessing deep rest does allow you to access wisdom and creativity, or maybe I should put it this way. When you are exhausted in your body or your mind or emotionally, you cannot access your deepest creativity and wisdom. And I think we've all felt, we all know what that feels like, to not feel that we can solve a problem or come up with a new idea because we're just so tired. But we do not rest in order to do more stuff. We rest because it is part of our human life. It's part of life. And it helps us feel better and more full. And that is worthwhile in and of itself, regardless of whether you go on to solve major problems or not. Sometimes we just need to do nothing. So yoga nidra, this technique that I trained in, I began teaching it about three or four years ago. And the more I have worked with it for myself, for my yoga students, and for my patients, the more I have fallen in love with it. And I will tell you right away, it is a sophisticated technique. All of this is true. It releases exhaustion at multiple levels lets you release physical exhaustion, mental, emotional. But what I love best about it is you don't need anything to do it. All you need is a comfortable spot where you can rest, and you don't need any experience. And to practice yoga nidra, all you do is listen and follow along. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> and for most of us, just saying, take 20 minutes and get comfortable and do nothing, just that feels like a great relief. 
but I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of this technique. And again, I am very well versed in this part of it because I teach it and because I write the practices, I create them for people. But to try out Yoga Nidra, you do not need to do, know any of this. But let's talk a little bit about what happens with your brain in this practice. We begin where we are right now, at the beta state. So right now, the awakened state of the brain, we, we name those the beta waves in, neuro, in neurology. And um, they are, this is when our brain is thinking and contemplating and taking in stimulus. So that's where we start. And at the beginning of the practice, you, you close your eyes and settle in and you listen to the teacher and you take a breath. Let's all just take a deep breath right now. And nothing special about the breath, just take in a nice deep inhale and let it out. And notice how your body feels. We begin to move into an alpha state. And alpha waves are that state of being when we are awake but we feel relaxed. So in that moment when you are watching the wildlife in your yard, or watching the bees, or hanging out with a cat or a dog, or a sleeping baby for that matter, and you feel yourself, your breath settling in, and you just feel content in that moment. That's the alpha state. And the more we access the alpha state in our day-to-day -day life, the less likely we are to have severe anxiety symptoms, to have insomnia that becomes problematic. So it's worth taking those moments to do nothing. You're training your brain to come back to alpha. As we progress through the technique, and again, for the person practicing yoga nidra, what you are experiencing is you're in your most comfortable bed or couch or chair, you're bundled up, your eyes are closed or relaxed, and you are simply drifting away. Many times people fall asleep during this practice, and that's absolutely fine, because your brain is listening. So you begin in the next stage, we cross into the theta waves. And these are the waves that we associate with REM sleep, which is the point in our sleep cycle where we go a little deeper and begin to dream. It's a point that many of us may not reach during our everyday sleep because we may not ever get deep enough, either because time is limited, we're not sleeping long enough, or because other things interrupt our sleep, or because we're not, we don't have enough practice getting to these deeper stages. And then we cross over into the delta waves. Delta is a deep restorative state. This is the state your brain is in when you are under general anesthesia. This is the state that when a person is put into a medical coma so that the body can heal, this is the state they are putting people in. So it's a state where everything is quiet. The body is quiet. The brain is very quiet. It is possible to access delta during very deep quality sleep. But again, many of us never get there, or we may only get there once in a while. In this practice, you get there, you can get there every time you sit down with the practice. And then the final state, the fourth state of consciousness in the practice, it doesn't even have a name in Western neurology because it's a state where the brain waves are very quiet. In Sanskrit, in the original language of Yoga Nidra, it's called Turiya, a state beneath Delta. It is a state where we are, Turiya would be described as a state where we are at one with everything. So at one that the brain doesn't need to work. We are simply settled into center. So it's a very quiet, profoundly quiet state. So, the, you will often see Yoga Nidra described, it will say, in Yoga Nidra, in a 20 minute, but the 20 minute practice is the equivalent of four hours of sleep. Now that's not based on that, there is much 
there, oh, there's a lot of clinical research being done on yoga nidra now, and that's why we have some of this identification of the actual brainwave states. That's why I started using it with patients because of the evidence I had about its usefulness for insomnia and anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. But um, that equation is an extrapolation. It comes from the idea that in order for most of us to get to delta waves in our ordinary sleep, we would need to have uninterrupted perfect sleep for at least four hours before we would touch that state. So again, many of us don't get there. Um, so this is a way that we can get, we can let our brains touch it and, and access it with a, a practice that we can fit into our lives, to be quite honest. Because ideally, we would all have time to sleep deeply. We would all have time to meditate. We would all have time to exercise. We would all have time to also do yoga nidra. But for most of us, one or more of those things is falling by the wayside. So, coming into this season and circling back to our tangible landscape, our native landscaping, it will be May next weekend, and many of you, I think, are already doing this, or at least have heard of it. No Mo May is a concept that arose from native landscaping in the UK, I believe originally, has crossed over to the United States, and every year I see more and more people catching on to it. The very simple idea, a lot like the soft landings, this is the idea that we need to leave, we want pollinators to be working, we need to leave them alone. And in this early stage of spring, in most of our have grass planted, you probably also have clover growing and dandelions and all kinds of things that could be defined as weeds. And I should point out that neither of those plants is technically native to the US. They are European imports, but so are our honeybees. And they are wonderful early food for all these insects. So when you leave the lawn alone for a month or whatever portion of May works for you, you're letting this work happen. And you're getting a break because you don't have to be out there mowing. And so it occurred to me this is an excellent time to experiment with rest. You've given yourself, if you've chosen to do no mow may, you have given the pollinators a gift, but you've also given yourself that time back to sit and watch the bees, to watch the wildlife in your garden, perhaps to try out something like yoga nidra. And I will be offering a yoga nidra class. I teach online so that everyone can be in their own space resting, so that you can just log in from a space where you're comfortable. And it doesn't matter if you snore or fall asleep or if your dogs and cats or children come into the room, that's all perfectly fine. And I will have that information on my website at mysticnidra.com. And there's cards in the back for anyone who's here today. But so I would invite you all to sign up for one of my classes. But most importantly, to remember this. Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do for your own health, for the health of the world, for the your ability to step back into the world and work on the things that matter to you, the most powerful thing you can do is take a break. So, an invitation for all of you to join me for Yoga Nidra practices during No Mo May. Find more information at mysticnidra.com. Um, my medical practice is at naturamedicamystic.com. We're located in the Packer Building in downtown Mystic. And I am Stephanie Rose. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for caring about the earth. Questions? Oh, yes. Um, I practice um, transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. Is there a comparison or a difference? There is a difference. I would put, so yoga nidra is often described as a meditation, but I am a long time meditation teacher, and so maybe I'm a little 
persnickety about the distinctions. To me, the definition of meditation is when we meditate, whether we are, whether it's TM or mindfulness meditation or any any style that you like, we pick an object or a mantra or it may be as simple as the breath. We pick something and we focus on it. And with meditation, we are building that capacity to focus. Now what happens as you sit in meditation is you get to know your own brain and the other things that come up, and you get to become more adept at letting things go and sticking to your focus. And I hope for all of us, we also are growing compassion for ourselves and the things that come up. But it's that focus that is the distinction. Because in Yoga Nidra, at least the way that I teach it and that I have used it, which is a very trauma-informed model, um, in Yoga Nidra, it's okay if your mind drifts. It's okay if you fall asleep. Whereas if you were sitting with, with to meditate with transcendental meditation, you want to stay on, on your point of focus for the whole period of meditation. So that's the big distinction to me. So they are, I would say they are related and complementary practices, but there's the distinction. And that's why sometimes yoga nidra is a, for people who have really struggled with traditional meditation, it's nice to know there's something you can do to give your brain a break, that it's okay if you can't hold the focus. Um, I will say for, for TM, which is probably the most widely studied and medically researched form of meditation, we do have really good evidence about its benefits, its many benefits for brain health and mental health. And um, you will, with any form of meditation, you will have the capacity to access those deep states of the brain with much practice and much concentration. Any other questions? Again, thank you all. Hopefully I'll see you around um, or online or out while we're all watching the bees. Happy Earth Day.